I'm Stephen Croshaw. And I'm Real Croshaw. For many years, we, <clears throat> we struggled to find recovery, not knowing what was really required. And so we want to share with you today the experiences that we've had. We had, for 32 years of marriage, struggled. And there would be years, several years at a time, when Stephen could be sober. And yet, I always worried, when is the next shoe going to drop? My own recovery has been critical in helping to, of course, find peace and direction in my own life, uh, but also to understand how to recover a marriage. I believe, and my experience shows, that if I hadn't chosen to work my own recovery from betrayal trauma, even if Stephen was working on his recovery, our marriage would not have survived. And we are not the only ones that we've seen this happen with. If a person, if a woman doesn't recover from the, the fear, the trauma, the anxiety, the marriage cannot only not survive, but thrive. And that was our goal, and that is our goal, that our marriage not just survive, but thrive. When I first started the journey of recovery in 2005, I didn't recognize the trauma that Real was experiencing. I didn't realize how much my behavior had created difficulties in her life that would require her to work on her own recovery because of trauma. Some marriages do not survive this. We are very aware of this and are sensitive to that. One person cannot create a marriage. And so if one spouse or the other do not work to recover the, themselves, a marriage will not work. It takes two people to recover a marriage. The motto of SA Lifeline is recovering individuals, healing families. That's our goal. What we're going to share with you took us about 40 years to understand. I think it was 35 years that we struggled to understand recovery in chapter five of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. It goes on to say that only those who are unwilling or unable to be honest will not find recovery. That's our message first is that honesty is critical. I have to choose to be honest about my efforts of recovery and my interaction with those who I must build trust with. We're going to talk about the recovery puzzle. In the middle of the puzzle is a willing heart. Uh, many addicts call that uh, occurring when we hit rock bottom. And my rock bottom truly was August 25th of 2005. I was arrested for picking up a prostitute and that brought me to a feeling that I had to change. And if I was going to change, it was going to require an honest effort on my part. The critical element that we see in the middle of the puzzle is a willing heart. I thought that if his willing heart was there, uh, I could be confident that everything would work out fine for us. I discovered that I needed to have a willing heart as well. And that willing heart was, this is not just about his issue. I have had trauma, and I have it, and my willing heart had to say, I am willing to do what it takes to recover, to become a better person, to become like the phoenix coming out of the fire. One more thing on a willing heart. For some people, it isn't really an event. It's more of a process. The process might require a lot of effort in humbly working recovery, attending meetings and working with the therapist and a number of um, different activities associated with becoming willing. But doing the work will help soften my heart. The next piece is education. Uh, for years, we could not find, or did not find, at least, information on what sexual addiction really was all about. And as we, 
as we found a little bit of education and had some therapy at that point, we learned a little more about what this did to our brains and our bodies and how, how we uh, re react to addiction and trauma. And that's been really important for us. Uh, in the years of working with the Foundation, we have found good quality education materials and written some ourselves uh, as SA Lifeline Foundation. And those materials and resources we encourage you to look at and to study. In my own experience, I need to tell you what doesn't work in regard to education. It doesn't work very well if my wife chooses to read all the books and I choose not to. Nope. Um, as work. I said, our story is long. <laughs> in my work of recovery in the late 90s, I, I came forward and was really trying to work recovery. I thought I was trying to work recovery. And in reality, what happened was Rill was trying to work recovery for me. And as far as education, she found books and read them. She explained to me what she had learned in these books, but I chose not to read the books. I chose not to become educated. Education is something that's critical for me to do as well as for my wife to do. Real trying to work education for me doesn't work. Another piece of the puzzle is qualified therapy. We have found over the years and working with, again, with thousands of people, that this puzzle piece may be uh, a relatively short amount of time, maybe 12 to 24 months. And therapists who understand sexual addiction and betrayal trauma have also seen it that they can help uncover some of the layers of emotional challenges for both individuals and help them work through the difficulties even in their past that have caused the some of the emotional reasons that people act out or or have trauma and so a qualified therapist also in our experience is one who Recognize the, recognizes the importance of 12-step work as well as qualified therapy for long-term recovery. Just very briefly, in the very first meeting we had with our therapist, who we love dearly, as I told him my story, and it took me probably 40 minutes to go through that, he listened intently, but after I finished, he didn't respond to me, he looked at my wife and said, can you stay with him and if he's in recovery? That was challenging to hear for real because she had no idea what recovery would take or what it looked like and really wasn't in a place where she felt like... I could trust it. She I didn't know if it. I could trust it. And that's why I needed to work my recovery as well. Mm. The great thing that the therapist said was, when Real said, how would I even know what recovery looks like? I've been lied to so much in my life. And he said to her, you will know. And the reason he said that is because as Real became more familiar with understanding recovery, what recovery takes and what it looks like, that she would be able to understand whether I was willing to actually work recovery and live in recovery and so, whether I could be safe or not. And safety and trust uh, are critical when there has been um, so much betrayal. This leads us now to another important part of the puzzle, which is appropriate boundaries for safety. In my own work of recovery, I recognized I had to make a lifestyle change. I had to do things differently. I couldn't continue in doing some of the things that I had previously, and one of them was travel. I, as a businessman, traveled a lot by myself, and that was very dangerous and also triggering for me. I had to make the decision that that wasn't going to work for me. Not all people are able to change that part of their lives. Another boundary for me was watching television. I determined that I would not watch TV by myself. It had been my, kind of my habit to sit down and watch TV and click through the channels 
and ultimately I recognized that that was very triggering. Another boundary is I don't go places that could potentially be triggering, I avoid them. And that helps me to stay safe. So boundaries for safety, I have to choose to make those. One of the things that we learned is I can't make Rail's boundaries and she can't make mine. If I choose to make hers or she chooses to make mine, it just becomes a point of resentment. So I need to be willing to make my own boundaries for safety. And it really helps me in my efforts to find trust and to develop trust to watch him hold his boundaries and his bottom lines because that just one experience, one event, one boundary at a time gives me little pieces of trust, little drops of trust that I know he's doing what it takes even though it's uncomfortable because boundaries are, are have been uncomfortable for most of us. But boundaries really are because I love myself and I love others. And it keeps relationships safe and healthy to have boundaries. And so learning about boundaries was new for me. My boundaries are for safety. And that is not about punishing him or controlling or manipulating him. That is not what a boundary is. A boundary is, this is what I need for safety. If this happens, then this is what must happen. And it, it must not be from a perspective of control, management, punishment, uh, trying to change him. In my experience, I have to go to that humble, honest place for myself and say, what do I need not based on anger or reaction, but a response to something that I need to feel safe. I think boundaries is a, is a subject that people understand little of and need to understand a lot of. So I would recommend that you read Rail's book, What Can I Do About Me? and study the boundaries chapter. And it's not only important for a person that's dealing with trauma to study that chapter, it's important for a person that deals with addiction to study that chapter. Boundaries for both of us, boundaries for safety are critical for our recovery and living in recovery. So the last and most important piece of this recovery puzzle is spiritual connection supported by working SAL 12-step. And what we have found is that long-term recovery is required. As our therapist said to us 13 years ago, it will no longer be called recovery, it will be called healthy living. And that is true, and that is what we have found. Because I have found, and so have thousands of other women who work recovery, that we cannot usually change the way our reactive brain is, is working by ourselves. And so going to 12-step meetings is one part of working recovery. It is the long-term recovery action that I continue after 10 years of working SAL 12-step. When I am confused or anxious or fearful, I can go to my 12-step work and call my sponsor and get myself clear. And in that effort, I also go to God and say, what's going on with me? What do I need? And how can I respond to this situation in a healthy way? 12-step work is the key for my long-term recovery. Most people starting recovery in that one of those most people is me, are fearful of going to meetings and very skeptical about what they'll find there. The first meeting that I went to, the first 12-step meeting that I went to, I, I went to the meeting with great fear and I was afraid that I was going to find people there that I would not relate to. I was afraid that I was going to find someone there that I knew. <laughs> that scared me to death. And so I was just pridefully afraid to participate in 12-step. I had had some experience, very brief experience with 12-step 
years before that 2005 event. In fact, it was about eight years previous to that. I went to four 12-step meetings, and there was prideful. I said, I don't belong here. I'm not dealing with an addiction, and I refused to go back. That was one of the very serious mistakes that I made early on in my efforts in recovery. <clears throat> so, I acknowledge well, from my own experience that choosing to go to 12-step is a choice that requires a lot of courage. I implore everyone who's watching this video to not be judgmental of the value of 12-step without giving it every opportunity to be successful. 12-step is the most critical part of my work of recovery and it is ongoing. 12-step is complementary to all other elements of the work of recovery. We talked about therapy for a moment before. A therapist that is really qualified will understand the spiritual nature of addiction, the spiritual nature of trauma. And the answers to helping us heal spiritually are found in working the 12 steps. Not just attending meetings, but in working the 12 steps with a sponsor. It requires a lot of effort and some time, requires a willingness to ultimately give back, but the rewards are truly all about what recovery is. Our motto for SAL 12-step recovery is lifelong recovery, one day at a time. That gives so much hope. Lifelong? You mean I don't have to be in fear and resentment or victim going forward in my life? Lifelong recovery. But it has worked one day at a time. You know, that sounds scary. <laughs> I want to find the finish line and be done. Be done, yeah. So many people say, okay, when do I graduate and go on with the rest of my life? The answer is, working the 12 steps on a continuing basis, I have the opportunity to give back. And if I am really thinking about what God would have me do in my life, I think that His message to me is, help other people on their pathway and on their journey. And I have not found another program or another process or another place to be more involved in helping others in need than I have in working 12 Step. Recovery is not an event. Recovery is a process. It's ongoing. It will be ongoing for the rest of my life, for which I'm grateful. But I don't have to fear that. I can look at this and say, this is an opportunity for me to live my life the fullest. Go to our website, sal12step.org. Look at the information. That is the purpose of our message. Begin your work of recovery now. And as we say in 12-step, progress, not perfection. It's wonderful to accept each other and ourselves as we are as we strive to work recovery and have healthy lives one day at a time. It's not a cakewalk. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a cakewalk. <laughs>